Hello, movie fans. Dimitri Panos here, back for another episode of Retro Rewind. How's it going, everybody? Uh, glad to be back. Glad not to be melting and sweating away. Um, albeit, I still have some refreshing beverage right next to me. Um, however, if I do start coughing, it's because the air quality due to the tragic fires going on uh, has not been the best, and it's kind of smoky uh, around the Los Angeles area. But we've got movies to talk about. And yes, it is another episode of Retro Rewind, uh, my special Halloween horror series to get everybody excited for Halloween, which will be a little over a month away. So today's Retro Rewind takes us back to July 13th, 1979, and that is when Universal released Dracula. Uh, the budget for this movie uh, was about $12.2 million, and it brought in $31.2 million, so not too shabby. The movie was directed by John Badham. Now, John Badham was coming off a huge, and I do mean a huge success, of Saturday Night Fever. Yes, he directed that. He's had quite the career because here are some other movies that you might recognize. They may be familiar to you that John Badham directed. He did War Games. Uh, he did the awesome Blue Thunder. Johnny Five came alive in the movie Short Circuit. Stakeout, which put Richard Dreyfus and Emilio Estevez together. He also did the English remake of La Femme Nikita, uh, called Point of No Return, and he did Bird on a Wire, which starred Mel Gibson uh, and Goldie Hawn. So as I said, the guy has had uh, a career in no shortage of, uh, of, of, of movies that made money for Hollywood. Uh, the movie was written by a gentleman by the name of W.D. Richter. And again, um, some movies that you may have heard of that he was involved with, either as writing or directing. Uh, he wrote 1978's version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That's uh, Donald Sutherland, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, a great version, a great remake. In fact, I even go as far as saying that that remake is even better than the original, and I do love the original. Uh, he also is a co-writer on John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. I mean, he gave us the Pork Chop Express. It's awesome. Uh, and he directed The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. I wish we could get a sequel or more sequels to that, but always remember that no matter where you go, there you are. So his screenplay is based off of the stage adaptation of Dracula, uh, written by Hamilton Dean and John L. Balderston. So the Broadway play also starred Langella. Uh, he was nominated for a Tony Award for his portrayal of Dracula. Uh, that play was set in Edwardian times, and it was strikingly designed by Edward Gorey. The play itself ran for over 900 performances between October 1977 and January 1980. So that's quite a run. The cast of this 1979 Dracula, well, as I mentioned, Frank Langella reprised his role from Broadway. Um, basically, the producers and Badham himself uh, went to Broadway uh, to see specifically uh, Langella. And after watching his performance, there really wasn't any doubt who would be suited for this theatrical remake uh, about Dracula. It also stars the great in classic Sir Lawrence Olivier as Van Helsing. Interestingly enough, and here's some spoilers, and I should have said this at the top, forgive me, um, I, I'm going to talk about certain plot points about this movie that if you haven't seen this version, 
And it is a bit of a different version. And I'm going to talk about some of those differences here. So if you haven't seen this, why haven't you seen it? I told you last week that I was going to be doing it. And it was your homework assignment. Um, I'm going to spoil some things, uh, including uh, what I'm going to talk about Sir Lawrence Olivier here. Uh, as, as he was willing to play the role of Van Helsing, uh, he did have it in his contract that um, he didn't want to be part of any sequels. Uh, so this was going to be a one and done for him. Uh, and, and he wanted to ensure it. So he uh, made sure that the writers and everybody would kill off Van Helsing, which for me is kind of sad. But it also, again, it makes things very different um, and makes this adaptation stand out some. Uh, this also starred Kate Nelligan. She was Lucy Seward. Uh, and this is Jonathan Harker's fiance. I really love Kate Nelligan in this role, and she's a fantastic, wonderful actress um, that could stand up to any male star that she was uh, uh, that she was given a role opposite against. She really is something to behold. She has a, a fantastic uh, screen presence, and in this role, the way that she plays Lucy. Uh, she is a very strong, and you, albeit you can tell she's a smart woman, uh, but she isn't one that uh, is befallen to hypnosis, uh, hypnosis and things like that. She is, in a sense, a suffragette of the time. Also, the movie stars the great Donald Pleasance as Dr. Jack Seward, and of course, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about him uh, later on. Um, but you should know right off the bat that for Donald Pleasance, 1979 uh, was a bit of a busy year for the guy. Uh, aside from Dracula, he starred in eight other projects, whether it be episodic TV, television miniseries, or movies. The guy did work hard for his money. Uh, Trevor Eve played the uh, Jonathan Harker uh, to round out that cast. And it really is a fantastic cast that fits in uh, very nicely to W.D. Richter's screenplay and, of course, Batum's direction. So the movie, uh, Batum was wise enough to get a gentleman. Gilbert Taylor was the cinematographer here. Now, some of you may be wondering, Gilbert Taylor, name sounds familiar, have I seen any movies uh, that he's shot? Well, have you seen Dr. Strangelove or A Hard Day's Night? Yeah, he, he was the cinematographer in those. Alfred Hitchcock's Frenzy. Uh, he worked with Richard Donner uh, in Donner when he did The Omen. And he also uh, was in this small little film called A Star Wars, written and directed by George Lucas. So again, Batum was smart to bring some talented crew people on board. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the look of the film uh, a, a little bit later on. Now, Gilbert Taylor wasn't the only person who came over from a galaxy far, far away to work on Dracula. No, he was not. Mastro himself, John Williams, was the composer and he scored this movie. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, this score is horrifyingly exquisite. The only thing scarier is the fact that it's not available anywhere. I know I looked and I don't want to pay a ton for a CD, but I couldn't find it on any streaming platform. Dracula, to me, his score here really does set uh, Williams apart. Because coming off of uh, Close Encounters, Jaws, uh, and then coming into Dracula here, uh, he, he definitely for sure is a composer who builds his music to set a scene. Uh, it is not wallpaper. It definitely can convey horror. It can convey romance. It's all in this. And... Uh, it really is a beautiful score to behold. I wish somebody would get the rights to it. 
pardon me, and release it because I think it is that good. And it is the Mastro himself. So Dracula 1979, I'll tell you right off the bat, is my second favorite Dracula movie of all time. Uh, my third favorite being uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Uh, albeit, uh, you can argue that that movie is bloated. But what you can't take away from Coppola's Dracula is its look and performances, particularly Gary Oldman uh, as the Prince of Darkness there. Um, it's just great. And it's a really fun movie to watch. And it has that Coppola zinging style to it. My First favorite, got to go to the Universal Classic 1931 with version Dracula with Bela Lugosi, also based off of the stage play. Uh, again, Todd Browning, how, how could you not love that Dracula? I grew up as a kid watching Bela Lugosi. You tell me who growing up didn't say the words, I want to suck your blood. Imitating Bela Lugosi, he set the standard for Dracula. Yes, many of you can argue too about Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing's Van, Van Helsing. They were great and fun too, but to me, they weren't as good. Those Hammer films were not as good uh, as the 31 classic, this 1979 uh, and... Um, Francis Ford Coppola's uh, Dracula. So it took Universal 48 years, 48 years later that they would go back to Dracula's castle with this version. So first up, this is a Dracula where the romance has heat and the horror has bite. Okay. Um, Dracula is, has always been a love triangle, so to speak, in, in whatever version, because there is, there is um, uh, Lucy or Mina, depending on the version, version you're watching, uh, uh, Seward, and Dracula. So this 1979 version really does focus a lot on the seduction and the romance of Dracula. Um, Badham's direction here too is just so tight. He perfectly balances the Edwardian period of elegance and decadence, and he offsets it with this dark Gothic horror and again, romance. It was just the right amount of gore. By right amount, uh, it, it earned the movie an R rating, uh, and Badham, though, also knew how to deliver the creeps without having any gore at all. So take, for example, Dracula scaling walls, okay? Uh, directing Langella doing this. And, and you know, it was, it was a good, simple trick, placing just, just camera trickery, so to speak. But it was how he felt filmed Langella and the mist and him prowling like a panther and he's just scaling the walls and there's one scene where uh, the camera is tracking him and Langella looks right into the camera at the audience vis-a-vis -vis you and let me tell you that scene has always stuck with me from when I first saw it as a kid. It stays with me today. And whenever I see the movie, and again, I just seen it very recently, it still gives me goof goosebumps thinking about it. Angelo was fantastic, but it was the way that it was directed. We had never seen anything like that before. Another scene uh, that I think is so spooky and creepy is a scene where Van Helsing is in the, the this dark, dank cave looking for his daughter, Mina. She, at this point, has become a bride of Dracula, so to speak. And while he's going through the caves, he trips. 
and he drops his cross into a deep puddle. And as he's padding around in the water, for he can't see it, a white reflection just slowly appears in the water. Van Helsing freezes and he looks up and it's none other than his daughter Mina who has turned and she has these red beady eyes. Her arms are outstretched and she just says, Papa. And without any weapon, nowhere to go, Van Helsing is backed into a corner and he can't escape. And she is speaking to him uh, as if, well, he is her father. And then uh, we have uh, Dr. Seward, Donald Pleasance, comes in to save the day. But the scene is so well done, and it is so creepy. And again, it's just one of the scenes with her head tilted, and just the way she says Papa with her, with her like, craggly, peeling skin and red eyes. Again, Badham knew how to direct, give atmosphere and horror. So I did talk about the romance here and how uh, Dracula uh, is is always a love triangle uh, between Lucy or Mina, uh, Jack Zewood, and Dracula. Uh, and unfortunately for our man Jack, he doesn't have a heck of a chance at all, especially in this 1979 version. He just doesn't compete at all with Langella. And, and think about it. I, I always feel bad for Jack Stewart because he's a well-to-do guy. He's not a fop. Uh, he has a good job. He's well in society. He would make a good husband. And I would never call him boring or droll. Uh, you know, his love knows no limits. Uh, he, you, know, for he, you know that he truly loves Lucy but the guy just can't compete with Drac. Just can't happen. Especially, like I said, Frank Langella, because Langella's performance in this version is just so frightfully romantic. The guy seriously oozes the suave charisma that I could only wish to have. Seriously. I mean, he wears his shirt in this movie uh, as if he were a pirate on the cover of a romance novel is open chest it's flowing i mean langella truly commands your attention uh male or female and when uh he makes his entrance in this movie in dr seward's home right he just he strides in with a confidence and an air about him uh he walks past the page and he doesn't even acknowledge him, but he whirls off his cape and he just tosses it in his arms without even looking at him and walks in and the camera is just on Langella. I'm Dracula. And what an entrance it is. Again, I'm not taking away from Lugosi the way that scene was edited and put in. It's fantastic. Or even Oldman to an extent. But man... The way that Langella plays this, you know, he this Dracula is one that truly seduces. He carries off the sexy and the scary. Uh, again, for example, in the scene where he, lack of better words, he ravishes Lucy. You understand why she gives in. And again, Lucy... A.K.A. Kate Nelligan, she's not necessarily, she's not hypnotized to him. She is just drawn to this, to this being. And again, poor Jonathan, he doesn't have a chance. Jonathan's the good guy. And as they always say, women are attracted to the bad guy. And there's, it's just undoubtedly, Jonathan was going to lose. And she isn't hypnotized, but she gives in willingly. And the scene itself is played out so, I don't know, you want to call it sexy? Sure. Because he kiss comes through the window with the mist. 
sh- chest bared open through this shirt. And the way he bites into her neck is even seductive. And when it happens, then the movie turns into, uh, well, an amazing laser show. It's just beautiful scene. It very much reminds me, if you're familiar with the fantastic rock documentary, uh, The Who, The Kids Are All Right, the movie ends um, with Won't Get Fooled Again. And there is a there is a fantastic laser show uh, they put on just before Keith Moon's amazing drum solo. Well, that's kind of what happens here in the way that Badham uh, had filmed this. There, you know, there's sex going on, but they do it in this fantastic way, uh, this gothic horror way. There's nothing frightening about it, but you understand what's going on. This seduction, uh, it really is. Uh, Some people may say it's over the top. I say for this version, I think it works. I think it works beautifully and wonderfully artistically. And you get it. You know what's going on. So I want to get back to Langella's performance. So Langella suffers from uh, something called, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, nystigmus. Uh, It's spelled N-Y-S-T-A-G-M-U-S. Okay. And basically what it is, is um, his eyes uh, will uncontrollably move. Uh, They almost look as if they're vibrating. Um, Prior to filming this, in full transparency, Langella talked to John Badham and the producers. And he said, hey, I got this problem. Um, you know, on stage, it's fine because I'm on stage. People are never that close where they can see it. But this is a movie. I know you'll use close ups and you're going to see my eyes will just involuntarily move. I can try to uh, tamp it down. I'll focus on something else. But I just wanted you to know ahead of time. And John Badham, being a great collaborator, uh, it just says, you know what? Let's just film it. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens, if anything at all. But let's just do it. Well, first shot where they're shooting a close-up, uh, it happens. And you can see it. And his eyes are going back and forth really fast. Uh, they film it. Batum says, cut. Uh, Langella could be thinking, oh, my God, I, my eyes are probably moving. They're going to tell me to redo it. But nope. Batum says, it works. We're keeping it. And not a problem at all. And I think that was a wise, great decision from Batman. Again, it's something else that I always remember from this version because it gave Dracula this otherworldly sense, whether he was trying to hypnotize uh, Mina, right? It gave this supernatural intensity. And I thought... Uh, It made the scenes better and watching it. I was like going, God, is he doing that on purpose? Like what is going on here? But you can't stop watching it and it never detracts. It ends up actually just being an important part and a great part of the narrative. And it makes Langella's Dracula stand apart without having to use makeup or anything. So he turned this problem into a real asset. And, 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 and again, I can't state enough. It sets his Dracula apart from everybody else's Dracula. So I um, want to also talk about uh, another reason I love this movie is because I thought they made some bold narrative changes. And it's not the Dracula that we're used to, whether we've read the novel or whether you were fortunate enough to see Dracula on stage. 1931, Bela Lugosi, and even the Coppola Dracula, um, the way this this movie opens up. Now, we're all used to, uh, whether it be Renfield or, 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 or Hark, you know, Harker, Jonathan Harker, going to Dracula's castle to get him to sign the deed for Carfax Abbey. It's a great part. Lugosi's Dracula sets the scenery for Coppola's Dracula. But here, the movie doesn't, it 
gets rid of all that, and we start the story on the uh, ill-fated voyage of the Demeter. And the Demeter, it's 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 going into darkness through a huge hurricane of a storm and the crew is scrambling scrambling to get a box a box thrown over uh, thrown overboard and you see that this box is a coffin and right then you know what's happening that the crew knows that they have evil aboard the ship in this box and they need to get it overboard before that whatever sun sets the uh, helmsman of the ship ties himself to the wheel. Uh, a big wave comes and knocks over crewmen in the box to the other side of the ship where they have to get up, struggle, bring it on over. And just as they're about to toss it overboard, a hand comes out and rips the throat right out of one of the crewmen. Boom. You're in. It's a great scene and it's a great way to start the movie off. And again, another great way in which it makes this 1979 Dracula its own because through exposition, we get it. We know who Dracula is, right? And then we know he's going to England to buy Carfax Abbey uh, and he's going for new blood, let's say. It really is a fantastic uh, attention grabbing thing for uh, opening for the movie. Then uh, another another very interesting thing that happens here is that we get the Lucy Mina name swap. So, as a Dracula fan, you know that it's Mina Harker that is in love with our Jonathan Harker, right? And it's Lucy who becomes, who's, who's Mina's friend, and she becomes the first victim, the bride. Um, so they do the swap. So Kate Nelligan is, is Lucy Seward. She's the daughter of Donald Pleasant's Doc, uh, Doc Seward, right? And Mina is something very interesting they do here as well. They make Mina Van Helsing's daughter, which, which is great. And I think it's great for the exposition, great for the narrative, because now we get another purpose for Van Helsing to come rush to the asylum to find out what happened to my daughter. And he gets embroiled in this supernatural and uses his smarts. And it also adds to the emotional, um, the emotional level of Van Helsing. It gives him pardon the pun, stake in the game. It also makes that scene that I was talking about earlier uh, in the in the caves, it makes it, it gives it heft. It gives it some emotion. Uh, and I'm really, I'm, I'm on board. I was on board with that change. I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, so those are just some of the reasons that make this Dracula stand out for itself, make it its own entity. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about Donald Pleasant's um, Dr. Seward. He plays another famous doctor, Dr. Loomis uh, in Halloween, uh, or it could be Donald Pleasant's AKA scene stealer. Uh, Donald Pleasance, uh, especially during the filming of this version of Dracula, uh, he annoyed some people because, well, he stole scenes. Uh, he stole screen time from folks. Um, in the movie, he is, uh, you'll notice he's always eating and sometimes to comedic effect. And Pleasance plays it greatly. And if you watch it, you think that it's done just naturally that it's part of the narrative part of the story. Uh, however, not necessarily. So see, you see, he would always have a bag of candy with him, brown paper bag. In fact, in a great scene, he's with Sir Lawrence Olivier and he's in a buggy and he's eating from this brown paper bag. And he, goes to offer uh, Van Helsing some of the candy. <laughs> he more or less, Olivia just slaps it away. It's almost as if, uh, not just annoyance for the character, 
I mean, Van Helsing just lost his daughter and this guy's offering me candy. But it, I, knowing what you what I know now and what I'm sharing with you, it's almost as if annoyance for like Donald Pleasance because what he would do is just before yelling cut, he would pop a candy in his mouth, making it so that they couldn't cut and there would be no way to cut around it without ruining the scene. Therefore, gaining Pleasance extra screen screen time above all his other actors <laughs> and you have to look on one hand i commend the guy for thinking about that and i can understand how other actors might have been pissed off at that but when you watch it in the movie uh it it's always it to me it was somewhat comical because the guy is always stuffing his face with something and at times he even has a mischievous smile knowing that the camera's on them and they can't go away. Uh, it is a great, great uh, performance. It'll make me want to watch, re when I rewatch the Halloween movies, I'll see what his device is for getting that extra screen time. So, uh, spoiler alert, let's talk about the ending to this movie. Um, so, the movie ends where it begins, on a boat. Uh, but the outcome is different this time around. So in it, we have Van Helsing, Harker, Lucy. Van Helsing and Harker are squaring against the vampire. And uh, Harker swings this, this hooked like wench into Dracula's back and he hoists him up. Uh, through the lower decks of the ship, right up on a mast, and it's daylight. And again, I think in a uh, in a fantastic turn, Langella, who's romantically suave, and or he goes from romantic to just feral, and he's just he's he's so angry, and he's he's angry at the sun. But yet he starts to peel and starts to lose his strength. And there's some great editing and in, 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 in it's wonderfully shot where he's spinning around. And with each passing spin, you see his skin peels and burns more and more and more until he becomes nothing. And his cape, his cape slides off and in the form of a bat just flies off into the sun. And meanwhile, back in the lower decks, uh, Lucy has become human again and looking up into the light. And the movie more or less ends uh, on her face and there is a definite smile. I'm not talking about a Mona Lisa smile. There's a smile on her face as we see the cape flying away, so to speak. Now, I always interpreted that as maybe Dracula is not dead. Um, I, th that's just the way that I had looked at it. However, after watching some commentary and John Badham, he threw in something uh, that totally made me rethink a lot of things about the ending. He, he had mentioned that Lucy knew that she was pregnant with the Count's child. And that even though the cape is flying away, the legacy in one way, shape, or form would continue. Now, it kind of blew my mind thinking about that. And I it, it made me think like, huh, okay. I guess that's possible, you know, because, well, on the one hand, when the cape flies off the hook, it does seem to be flying with a purpose. It's not erratic or anything. It seems to have a direction. But take, for example, take for argument's sake that, yes, maybe it does have a direction. It's just being caught in the ebbs and flows of the wind. What if she is pregnant? I was like, wow, that's kind of amazing that's i didn't think of it that way uh i'd very much love to know what you might think of that and had you thought of that before i hadn't 
but that's part of the reason I have conversations about movies with, with, with people is because sometimes somebody will share something with me that I didn't think of and it's well thought out. It'll make me rethink about my position about the movie. That's one of the great things about movies in general. So uh, comment on YouTube or anywhere and let me know what you think about the ending of Dracula 1979. Now, one other thing I, I want to talk about too is the version, the version of Dracula uh, that, that you watch. There are, believe it or not, two versions. Now, uh, back in 78 or when, when Universal had contacted John Badham, uh, and he signed on for the project, he originally wanted to film the movie in black and white. Universal had said no. And you can understand at the time, 1979 movies were going through an evolution and Universal probably thought at that time, black and white, Ooh, some audiences might be afraid of that because we're heading into full born color. And especially when you looked at movies like Jaws, Close Encounters, Star Wars, Exorcist, um, these were in living technicolor. And then to go back to black and white could scare audiences away. You understand the decision. However, Badham was able to go back and do, um, well, not necessarily a black and white version, but what they call a desaturized version. Um, Shout Factory just released Dracula on Blu-ray, and they include both versions. They include a desaturized version and the theatrical um, color version. So for me, uh, watching the desaturized version it really lends a whole new tone to the movie. It's almost noirish. Uh, it's almost like the muted colors, flesh tones don't quite exactly pop. Um, it lends to the tone and atmosphere of the setting. And I really found myself really loving this. And albeit not black and white, there were some colored, albeit, they were desaturated out. They were muted. And it lent to some really great horror scenes, including the ones I talked about, scaling the walls, in the caves, even on the boat. And, and even to a great extent, the, the, the love scene uh, in the movie. And I can tell you, uh, when you watch side by, if you watch side by side for a comparison, man, the colorization, the technicolor, it, if you're watching the desaturated version and then you go right to the color version, it could hurt your eyes. Just, just a fair warning. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I don't want to insult the color version. It's the, it's the version that I grew up with. But it is that stark of a difference. And I do highly recommend that you can uh, get this on Blu-ray. Um, but also if you have cable, I believe it's like on Showtime, maybe Encore. Dracula is on the cable channels right now. One of one of them. Uh, like I said, you can look it up, look it up on demand because uh it's been on in rotation this past week, and they are showing the desaturated version. So this seems to be the go-to version now of, of Dracula. So if you get the Blu-ray, you can get both versions or seek it out on cable and on demand and you'll get the desaturated version. Uh, and again, let's make it part of the discussion. Which version do you like better? Um, I'm going to eke out with the desaturated version just a little bit better only because it, it amplifies the tone um, and the atmosphere of the movie. And uh, that's why it's great to watch. Um, so there you have it. Dracula, 1979. Um, time to wrap up. I wanted to thank Scott Menzel for producing, uh, setting up the link so that you can see it. I want to thank you fine folk for tuning in and giving your time to watch uh, and, and listen to me just go on about movies. Uh, your homework assignment for next week, should you decide to accept, I'm going to have a special, it's going to be a special episode of Retro Rewind. Halloween Horror Edition, 
where we're going to be talking about ghosts. And we're going to talk about two movies, two great ghost stories. In fact, probably some of my, my favorite ghost stories uh, and how uh, they kind of connect. But I'm going to talk about what makes them great. And those movies are John Irvin directed A Ghost Story, which stars the likes of Fred Astaire, uh, John Houseman, uh, and, and Craig Wasson, and uh, Alice Krieg. And I'm going to follow that up with The Fog, John Carpenter's The Fog, the original. These are two great ghost stories. And they are what a good ghost story is all about, albeit they're very different. But there's something about them that connects them. Do you know what that is? I'm sure you can figure it out. Um, so that is what I will be cramming two movies into one episode. And uh, so that it'll be a lot of fun as we continue Halloween horror. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I look forward to being with you next week. I hope you have a great week. And uh, hey, keep talking about the movies. Take care. Bye.